Welcome to Bethel Baptist Worship at Home on the 19th of July 2020. Please refer to page four, you can find this on the website, about going back to Bethel for worship on the 26th of July 2020. Today's testimony is from Diane. Diana. Thank you, Diana. Diana says she was having troublesome time with her neighbours, amongst other things, and was finding it difficult at work. However, the Lord, right there at work, started to bring to her attention Bible verses in some of the products she was packing. For example, who of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to your life? Since you cannot do this very little thing, why do you worry about the rest? That's from Luke 12, verse 25 and 26. And then, to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy, to the only God our Saviour, be glory, majesty, power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord, before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Words from Jude, chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. And then those famous words, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. From Jeremiah 29, verse 11. And Diana's prayer for all of us is this, Lord, give us all your love and help us to accept it. Help us to trust you to remove all the obstacles and enemies we face. We praise you, Lord, because in times of trouble, you are always with us. In Jesus Christ, Amen. Again, thanks for that, Diana. Well, we'd like to say a happy and blessed birthday to Margaret, whose birthday is tomorrow, the 20th of July. And today's worship song has been chosen by Marjorie. Thank you, Marjorie. And it's, I serve a risen saviour, he's in the world today. I know that he is living whatever men may say. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. So please stop this video here and go on to YouTube and sing along with that. He lives, he lives, Christ Jesus lives today. Today's word is from Max. Chapter 26 and verse 14, which reads, We all fell to the ground, and I heard a voice saying to me in Aramaic, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goals. Acts chapter 26 verse 14. We're especially looking at those few, uh, those last words. It is hard for you to kick against the goals. This is quite a remarkable statement from Jesus, aren't they all? We would expect him to at the least have given Saul of Tarsus a good telling off, to rebuke him for all the damage he is doing to Jesus' infant church. But nothing of the sort, for he says to Saul, it's hard for you to kick against the goads. Is it too much for us to paraphrase this as, Saul, I feel sorry for you, because it's hard for you to kick against the goads, because you're actually fighting against God, and by doing so, do you realise that you are really hurting yourself? I'm tempted to say, well that's the upside down kingdom of God for you, but the kingdom of God is always the right way up, and we're the ones who are upside down. This is one of the many numerous examples in the scriptures of which the book of Acts has more than its fair share of the remarkable ways, the sovereign ways, the all-powerful ways, the amazing ways, the impossible to work out ways, the hidden ways, the higher than our ways of the kingdom of God. Let's look at this in more detail. 
A goad was a stick used by a farmer to prod an animal, especially an ox, as he was ploughing the field. The metaphor is obviously that of the ox being prodded to pull steadily or to make a straight furrow, says James Dunn. In other words, a certain standard was expected from the ox, which was to pull steadily and in a straight line. Should he go off course, he would get a prod. If the ox was foolish enough to kick back, then he would receive an even more painful prod of his own making. There are various applications of this. Some explain it as a kicking against one's conscience. And you can see this type of thought in J.B. Phillip, Phillips's translation of the New Testament. However, I go with this one. A proverb here meaning, it is hard for you to resist God's purposes for your life. Quote from Strauss. The goads against which he was now told it was fruitless for him to kick were not the prickings of a disturbed conscience, but the new forces which were now impelling him in the opposite direction to that which he had hitherto pursued, the new necessity which was henceforth laid upon him, as we can read about in 1 Corinthians 9 verse 16. And that was a quote from F.F. F. Bruce. Well, we can talk about the opposite direction, as here in this quote by F.F. F. Bruce, and moving from the old covenant to the new. But we can also talk of a continuation of a process from the old to new. As in, for example, a caterpillar becoming a butterfly. It's all part of one process. Paul, it seems, was sticking to life as a caterpillar. And it was hard work. He needed to let go and let God, to let Jesus, to let metamorphosis take place. We see this clearly in Paul's testimony later on. He writes in Galatians chapter 1, verse 13 to 16, For you have heard of my previous way of life in Judaism, how intensely I persecuted the church of God and tried to destroy it. I was advancing in Judaism beyond many of my own age among my people and was extremely zealous for the traditions of my fathers. But when God, who set me apart, from my mother's womb and called me by his grace, was pleased to reveal his son in me so that I might preach him among the Gentiles. The fact is, God never has a plan B, be it with Saul, Paul, with the early Christians, with his church, with you, with me, with Bethel Baptist Church. It's his plan from beginning to end and it will happen, full stop. He was and is and always will be the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, and all that's in between. So to everyone, believer and unbeliever alike, let's not fight against him, but let's work with him. Let's cooperate. Church history has many examples of churches convinced they were doing God's will, just like Saul of Tarsus was convinced he was doing God's will. And yet in hindsight, they have been resisting that which God was seeking to do. For example, the life of John Wesley. He was a member of the Church of England, which strongly disapproved of him preaching in the open air. And thus began the Methodist movement. Then we can think of the resistance to the Pentecostal and charismatic movements. God wants to do the next thing, which is a new thing also, but is a continuation of what he has already begun. Let us not be those who resist and fight it. It's hard to kick against the goals. Why try to fight against God? You'll never win. What lies behind this? A testimony I've heard quite a number of times during lockdown is this. I couldn't get through 
this without the Lord? This is then extended to include others. I don't know how people cope in life without the Lord. And the bottom line is, they are not coping. Conversely, I'm sure many of us have had this experience of looking at someone's life and thinking, they seem to be getting on quite well without the Lord. However, as we have got to know them better over time, we start to think differently. And like all of us, before we came to Jesus, they have built their lives on sand. And when the storms of life come, they are greatly shaken. They can't cope. They start to sink. Such is the plight of humankind. No exceptions. This brings to mind these words in Romans 8 verse 20. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one who subjected it in hope. Romans chapter 8 verse 20. The words, the word used here for frustration, or as it's translated in the NCV, useless, or in the NASB and NKJV, futility, or in the LL, New uh, Living Translation, God's curse, and then in Young's literal translation, vanity. So we've got frustration, futility, God's curse, vanity. It's the same idea. And it's used only once in one other place, in Romans chapter 1 verse 21, in a passage where the plight of humankind is so vividly depicted. And that's Romans chapter 1 verse 18 to 32. James Dunn in his commentary on Romans gives us an example to explain this word. The sense of the futility of an object which does not function as it was designed to do so. Like, for example, an expensive satellite which has malfunctioned and now spins uselessly in space. Vine's New Testament Dictionary explains it like this. Emptiness as to results is used of the creation as failing of the results designed owing to sin. Following the fall, God subjected the whole of creation to futility, to fr frustration, to vanity. This is not done in a malicious way by God, but rather in love, for God is love, and everything he does is done in love. This word that the Apostle uses here is the same one used in Ecclesiastes for meaningless in the Greek translation of the Old Testament. As we read in Ecclesiastes chapter 1 verse 2 and verse 12 to 14, meaningless, meaningless, says the teacher, utterly meaningless. Everything is meaningless. I, the teacher, was king over Israel. I applied my mind to study and to explore by wisdom all that is done under the heavens. What a heavy burden God has laid on humankind. I have seen all the things that are done under the sun. All of them are meaningless, chasing after the wind. And when we think God has subjected this world to that type of thing, to meaningless, futility, frustration. It's fascinating what conclusion King Solomon comes to in his book of Ecclesiastes. And he even mentions the same word that we've been looking at in Acts, the word goes. We read at the end of Ecclesiastes, Solomon's conclusion, in chapter 12, verse 11 to 14. The words of the wise are like goads, their collected sayings like firmly embedded nails, given by one shepherd. Now all has been heard. Here is the conclusion of the matter. Fear God and keep his commandments. 
for this is the duty of all humankind. For God will bring every deed into judgment, including every hidden thing, whether it is good or evil. The word frustration in Romans 8 verse 20, which is also uh, translated futility or vanity, this word can be regarded as nearly equivalent to bondage to decay, which we read about in Romans 8 verse 21, or slavery to corruption in some other versions. Try stopping this physical body that we live in from change and decay, from growing old. It's impossible. It's been subjected to decay. Try living in this physical frame forever. No way. Try beating God at his own game. No chance. It's hard to kick against the goads. It is humanly impossible to take the frustration and futility out of life here on planet Earth. The fact is that following the fall, God subjected, and this is a divine passive that means clearly that this was subjected by God, and it particularly refers to Genesis, 3, Genesis chapter 3 verse 17 to 18. His creation was subjected to frustration by God himself following the fall of Adam and Eve. His creation was subjected to futility, to meaninglessness. And he did this in love to give us hope. For there are two more words here in Romans 8 verse 20 that we need to consider. For the creation was subjected to frustration, not by its own choice, but by the will of the one God himself who subjected it in hope. We mustn't forget those two words at the end there, in hope. And that hope is that the creation will be liberated, as we read in eight, chapter 8 verse 21, that the creation itself will be liberated from its bondage to decay and brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. We now, the children of God, are much more in Christ than we would have ever been in Adam. We are more now we are in Christ than we would have ever been had we remained in Adam. So yes, it is hard for Saul of Tarsus to kick against the goads, but there is a purpose behind this, that ultimately he might be brought into the glorious freedom of the children of God. The conclusion of the matter. So what is all this saying and meaning? To put it bluntly, life is absolutely rubbish without Jesus, without him in your life, and without carrying out his plans and his purposes for your life. Anything else is hard work and painful, totally frustrating, futile and meaningless, a kicking against the goals. So kick away and hopefully one day you will meet with Jesus. Is that extreme? Well, no, not in the light of eternity, which should always be our perspective. People are needy, frustrated, living empty lives. And again, this provides a wonderful opportunity for the church to be there and bring hope to all people. For all people are the same. They've been subjected to frustration. And as they come to that realisation that there has to be more to life than this, we can introduce them to Jesus who saves. The thief comes only in order to steal and kill and destroy. I have come that they may have life and enjoy life and have it in abundance, life to the full and life overflowing. Words from John chapter 10, verse 10, in the Amplified Version. Amen. 
I've chosen this as a quote of the week. C.S. Lewis wrote in 1942, and these are words of Satan himself. Satan saying, I will cause anxiety, fear and panic. I will shut down businesses, schools, places of worship and sports events. I will cause economic turmoil. And these are words of Jesus. Jesus saying, I will bring together neighbours, restore the family unit, I will bring dinner back to the kitchen table. I will help people slow down their lives and appreciate what really matters. I will teach my children to rely on me and not the world. I will teach my children to trust me and not their money and material resources. Some words written by C.S. Lewis in 1942. And I've chosen this as the verse of the week from Isaiah 54 verse 14. In righteousness you will be established. Tyranny will be far from you. You will have nothing to fear. Terror will be far removed. It will not come near you. Amen. Let's pray. Loving Heavenly Father, your ways are perfect. Your ways are past finding out. But for those things you have revealed to us, we give you praise and thanks. We worship you, Sovereign Lord, creator of the heavens and the earth. We thank you for this abundant life in your Son and for the gift of your Holy Spirit. Lord, guide us regarding the right children and families worker for Bethel Baptist Church. Lord, we thank you for the three applications we have received so far from Radu, Julia and Bing and pray that you guide them also, that they might be in the right place, doing your work in the right time, in the right way. Lord, be with your people throughout the nations of the world. Help them to boldly proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ's death and resurrection. We especially pray for Pastor Inti and the church in India, as many demands are upon them, especially to provide food to the poor and needy. Lord, we pray at Bethel that you'll supply us with an abundance, not that we can be selfish, but that we can bless others in need, and that such giving will result in praise and thanks to you who gave everything through your Son, Jesus Christ. Amen.